uh, very nice to be here today. And thank you everyone for joining our panel on tangible and intangible heritage as part of the Chinatown Reimagined Forum. It's my pleasure to be moderating our discussion today with five very knowledgeable and experienced panelists. And before we begin, I know that Tyler uh, had already made land acknowledgements, but I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Squamish, Sewatu, and Musqueam peoples who continue to steward the land that we are on. My name is Karmit, and I am a member of the Chinatown Legacy Stewardship Group. I sit on the group as a representative of the Heritage Vancouver Society. So in the session today, uh, we continue this morning's discussion on intangible and tangible culture heritage. Um, just kind of a brief overview of our uh, panels today. Uh, we're looking at, firstly, uh, a Chinese society heritage building and how heritage assets are lived and practiced. Uh, then we dive into the importance of stories and storytelling in the Chinatown community uh, before looking beyond Vancouver and looking at examples in Hong Kong, including the close ties between heritage and community there before we finally start to imagine a future where both intangible and tangible heritage can be supported. So we have a series of four uh, very exciting presentations before we dive into a joint discussion. Um, I'll introduce our speakers as we go. Uh, first up, we have Ainsley Wong. Ainsley is a director at the Wong's Benevolent Association. She has represented the Wong's Association with the Chinatown Legacy Stewardship Group and Cross-Cultural Walking Tour. As a fourth generation Chinese Canadian descendant from a railway, railway worker, she is passionate about preserving and sharing cultural heritage. So welcome Ainsley and I'll, and I'll, I'll leave it to you. Um, good afternoon. As Carmen had said, my name is Ainsley Wong. I'm a fourth generation Chinese Canadian. I've been a board member at the Wong's Association for the past five years. This is a new connection for me as we had lost ties with the association after my grandfather passed away. Through volunteering with the association, I have gained a new appreciation for cultural heritage in Chinatown and the importance of preserving it for the future. Today, I'm going to share with you some of the challenges a clan society faces as we attempt to preserve our legacy. Next slide, please. On the built heritage side, the Wong's Association has two buildings on the city's heritage register. The main headquarters is at 123 East Pender Street, the yellow building in the photo. This is classified as heritage category A of primary significance. The building dates from 1910, although they were significant early renovations under Ch Chinese Canadian architect W.H. Chow in 1921. At this time, the original top floor was demolished to make room for the school and the assembly hall that we have today on the third and fourth floors, and that was on top of the existing ground floor storefronts and the mezzanine level. The storefronts today have tenant businesses which are culturally appropriate to the Chinatown neighborhood. There's Ochi, a Chinese boutique, and Good Luck Video, and these goods are vital to the elderly Chinese residents in Chinatown who are primarily monolingual and reliant on Chinese media. Next slide, please. The other building is the Han Sing building at 29 East Pender Street. This one was constructed in 1910 and is classified heritage category B of significant value in the city. The Hansing Athletics Club is located on the third floor where you see the lanterns and flags positioned. In 2019, we had our long-term storefront tenant leave that was Bombast and they were a mid-century modern furniture store. They vacated the premises and we began the search for a culturally appropriate use of the space. Next slide, please. We were really pleased to be able to lease the Hansing storefront to the Chinese Canadian Museum Society. 
the museum took out building permits for the renovation in order to create the gallery space for the exhibition, A Seat at the Table. This required a change of use permitting for the space. As Barry McGinn talked about this morning, one of the difficulties with renovations in one part of a heritage building is that it's difficult to determine the scope of work at the outset because there may be significant upgrades required throughout the whole building. We found this to be the case with the fire alarm where the storefront fire alarm needed to be upgraded with an upgraded system in the top three floors. So what started as a tenant renovation became a major capital upgrade for the Wong's Association. With thanks to the city's cultural services department and the BC Arts Council, we were able to obtain grants to cover the cost of a new fire alarm system and upgrades to the exits, exit signs and emergency lights. We know the fire alarm is just one small part of the upgrades that will be required in the future. And we expect, as John Atkins said, to be sideswiped by the requirements. Next slide, please. Besides dealing with the renovation and building upgrade in the Han Sing building, um, before we could rent to the Chinese Canadian Museum, we had to have many discussions at the board level. The Wong's board is primarily composed of first generation men in their 80s. Their view has been that the society buildings should serve the traditional purposes of the clan only. And because there is historical discrimination against Chinese Canadians, there's a mistrust of government agencies. There has always been significant opposition to the Wong's obtaining government grants, even though in recent years we have received some city funding for roof repairs and a capital upgrade assessment report with James Weldon, but it's not without um, difficult discussion. And last year, the prospect of renting space to the museum entity because it's funded by the government, that was somewhat controversial. And then we found the building upgrades were daunting. Uh, young, younger board members were able to work with the city, the museum, architect, engineer, and trades. And now we are currently at the stage of completing all the requirements for the museum's temporary occupancy. Next slide, please. The Wong's Association faces many challenges today, as do other clan societies. The first problem is our aging membership and limited capacity of the volunteer board. The older generation has challenges with English language technology, and the younger members work full time outside of Chinatown, and we have limited ability to attend to business during the day. We continue to be challenged by building issues. We have aging infrastructure in our two buildings and much of the building maintenance has been deferred over the years. As we found, a change of use of occupancy required numerous upgrades and these present financial challenges. And of course for us, safety and security in the neighborhood is also an issue. And this week we had another attempted break in at the Han Sing building from a neighboring roof. Um, the Wong's Association has some underutilized spaces and we could repurpose them for other uses to add to the city's availability of cultural spaces as Bill highlighted that need this morning, but doing so would require broader discussions within the organization. In order to support continued use of our buildings, we are hopeful that a different tax structure could be investigated for society buildings. And we are also very interested in the proposed cultural land trust for Chinatown. That would help with the management of our building assets while allowing us to maintain ownership. And the final slide, please. Thank you. Um, despite all of the challenges that we face, we have a desire and a commitment to maintain aspects of intangible cultural heritage within our spaces. We have Kung Fu and Lion Dance instruction, we have Cantonese Language School with Youth Collaborative for Chinatown, and we are a social club for the members who play mahjong in the afternoons. We hope that we can maintain and expand the Hansing Athletic Association to keep youth involved 
and to continue to offer language programs at Mon Kiang School. But perhaps most important for us is the preservation of family rituals, which take place in our assembly hall and at the Chinese altar in Mountain View Cemetery. These ceremonies are unique to us in the world, and they're different from the ones practiced in our home villages in China. These ceremonies give thanks to our ancestors for the sacrifice they made in coming to Canada to provide a better life for us. And lastly, of growing importance is the preservation of photographs and documents, which started in the 1990s with Uncle Tim, he's the older gentleman in the photo. He found um, lots and lots of old photographs that were stuffed away in closets and drawers, and he started framing them for display up on the top floor. And um, we're now continuing with Vice President and Historian Jeffrey Wong, who is digitizing literally two buildings worth of material from the last century. It's really exciting because we're uncovering history through the eyes of our people. And we're finding some new to us firsthand accounts of some historical events which took place in Vancouver. I'm personally finding this super interesting. Our hope is to relearn history from the perspective of our predecessors and to preserve and share our cultural heritage more broadly in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ainsley, for the presentation. Um, you really painted a really uh, wholesome picture for uh, the real uh, experiences in the Chinatown community for heritage buildings and associations. Um, and it also made a really nice segue into our next speaker, um, Catherine Clement, who will talk about her uh, experience in curation. And Catherine Clement is uh, an independent community curator and exhibition designer whose work has focused on the lesser known or forgotten stories of Chinatown. She has curated a number of historical exhibitions into the, including the Chinatown History Windows Project and the very popular exhibition Chinatown Through a Wide Lens, the Hidden Photographs of Yu Cho Chow, and also the award-winning companion book by the same name, both of which we'll be hearing about today. Catherine's next project is the paper trail to the 1923 Chinese Exclusion Act, which will consist of a crowdsourced exhibition and community archive to commemorate the 100 years since the passing of the Chinese Exclusion Act. So we hope we have time to hear about that a little bit today. Um, but without further ado, uh, welcome Catherine and I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much. And let me just uh, get my screen sharing going here. Oops. Can everybody see that? Yeah, good. Um, if the walls could talk, I cannot believe how many times I used to say that to myself um, as I spent numerous, numerous hours with people in their 80s and 90s, a lot of them World War II veterans, but others who would uh, have lunch with me or have a tea and then we would walk around Chinatown and or they would show me their photos and there were so many interesting things that uh, they were telling me about, things that never made the newspapers but were more personal memories or, or other kinds of community memories of Chinatown. And um, I'm just showing these photos because what I'm half Chinese and it's interesting that uh, I've come back to Chinatown over the last 12 or 13 years and have discovered this rich treasure trove of what are very much uh, personal community stories. And as we'd walk along, um, they would tell me about, oh yeah, well, so-and-so used to eat there and here's where uh, we had dances Here's where uh, we would have, um, there was a rumble between all the white kids and all the Chinese kids and the cooks came out with their meat cleavers and uh, to break up the fights. And I thought, was it, isn't it amazing that within these, oh, and they would tell me about the poultry place, which was so famous, go pick your chicken for the night. And I thought it was so interesting that, you know, we were seeing a very different Chinatown back in 2016 and 2017. And yet, if these walls could talk, they, there were so many interesting 
things that transpired in these buildings, on these streets, on these sidewalks. And that became the, the genesis of a project called the Chinatown History Windows, which I'm very pleased to say was funded by the, uh, the city of Vancouver. And basically what it, what it was, it was a project to take 22 storefront windows, whoops, through Chinatown and use the windows as sort of murals. They were, they were like canvases in many ways that we could use to help tell some of these stories that, uh, that took place in this community. Um, here's an example of what was the building, which was the Ho Ho, uh, Chop Suey building initially. And I had seen this photo of uh, Lena Horne, the famous uh, American uh, singer, and uh, Wang Fun Si, who used to be the mayor of Chinatown, eating within the Ho Ho. And we wound up uh, thinking that that would actually be a great photo to put onto that abandoned building and get rid of the graffiti and uh, tell a little bit of the story of this particular building. Here, you're not seeing it. There is a story panel just on the side window, which actually uh, talks about the Ho Ho and its, and its role in, in this community especially that uh, three-story uh, neon sign of a steaming bowl of rice. So you know, the city of Vancouver gave us the funding. We, we wound up doing, as I said, 22 storefront windows. Many of them were empty. So this gave us a ch chance to, uh, to use these empty windows to, to tell various stories. Um, and we did a variety of things from produce to politicians. Here is the story of two entertainers. Uh, Harvey Lowe and Patty Wing, um, who was a forgotten uh, tap dancer and actor. Um, it, was, uh, it was wonderful to see people stopping. I have many pictures with crowds gathering to read these particular stories. So people were getting a little bit more information about what had transpired here. This was the, uh, the uh, Chinatown Hillbillies Band, which uh, operated in the 30s. This is on top of the uh, WK Gardens restaurant. This photo was taken. So some of these were photos that weren't necessarily seen a lot too. So that was exciting to show some of them. We even did something near Hogan's Alley uh, about the different performers and people that were once in that area of Chinatown. And those two men that you see th there in the uh, photo, that's them now as, as, uh, as older men. And uh, I, I finish on this one for the Chinatown history windows because this was, um, um, I had been uh, looking for the photographs of this particular photographer named Yu Cho Chow. I had found his work when interviewing World War II veterans, but he was forgotten. There was very little information about him. And it took me many years to finally find a picture of him. And it became, uh, uh, adorned on one of the history windows. And what was really interesting is that this woman saw it. Her name is uh, Judith Maxey Collins. And she, um, she wrote to me and told me, well, I don't know if you know, but Yu Cho Chow was also, you know, the, the main photographer for the early Black Canadian community. And that started, that was a very transformational uh, moment because from there we discovered his, his uh, capturing the images of the South Asian community, the early mixed race community, et cetera. But it all started because of this mural that we did in Chinatown. So that segues into what happened with all that. So we start, we do the history windows and uh, all these photos start coming in. All these stories start piling into me about Yu Cho Chow and uh, who, who photographed between 1906 to 1949 during a time when there was a lot of racism. So he was unique in that um, he photographed, he was willing to photograph everyone at a time when many white photographers would not photograph uh, people who were, of, um, who were not white. So these photos started coming in of a mixed race family, uh, an early black Canadian entertainer, uh, uh, these are actually women of Hindu descent, Sikh, early Sikh Canadian men. Uh, these are early Polish immigrants. Even they um, 
often the Eastern European immigrants were often considered you know, sort of the bottom of the pecking order among, in the white community, but they came to Yucho Chow. He was affordable and friendly. And this is another, this is actually from the United Church, but it's another mixed race, early mixed race couple where the father's Chinese and, and the, the woman is white. So this in turn, because of, again, going back to this mural, which in turn led to all this, uh, uh, all these photos starting to come into me, uh, led to the uh, exhibition in May of 2019 called Chinatown Through a Wide Lens, the Hidden Photographs of Yucho Chow. And again, City of Vancouver supported this particular uh, exhibition, which really told the story of this very multicultural community that existed in Chinatown, that it was actually Chinatown was the place where people were accepted, no matter what your religion or skin color or income level, you would be served in Chinatown. And so the exhibition had two parts. One section was devoted actually to Yu Cho Chow himself and his life in the studio. And uh, we had a few props there from him. So that was, uh, his, uh, who he was. And then the main part of the exhibition was what I called the community photos. And we couldn't show them all, but we curated them into themes, uh, photos of families, photos of entertainers, soldiers, weddings, lots of wedding photos, lots of family photos. And this photo was taken very early in the morning on a weekday. And uh, what was interesting for a month long exhibition, we had uh, the Chinese Cultural Center and estimated about 5,000 people came through. And here's, it's a story of the past, but you see people interested in learning more. Each, each photo had a label, a little story about what we knew about the people in the image. And I was surprised at just the volume of people that came um, some of them because, in this case, this woman, uh, her family, they um, own Benny's in, uh, in Chinatown. They, uh, they had um, a photo of theirs there. But also what happened, again, is because of the show, even more photos started coming in. And here's me being sort of uh, <laughs> surrounded by people who brought in their photos. To, uh, to show us and to, uh, to tell us the story about them. So we went from having very little information about uh, Yu Cho Chow and very few of his photos in public archives to now having over 650 images from private collections. And they have now been transferred to the city of Vancouver. Uh, they're just going through cataloging, but soon they'll be available for the public uh, to, to see and to study. And what's been interesting for me with all this, of course, is that all of this material was out there. It was ready to be found and told. And it's, it's, uh, it's all crowdsourced. So that exhibition would not have been possible without the community, broader community, uh, not just the Chinese community, but broader community involved. That, that inviting crowdsourced material engages people in Chinatown and their history. And so many people would start to tell me and, and would be telling their kids and grandchildren their memories of Chinatown. And that engagement helps them to value this neighborhood, this historic neighborhood so much and actually invites them to return to it and to, to start to create a new generation of links uh, of people who are linked to this community. And uh, what's, what's so interesting is that this is um, a community is, is not just its building, it, it is the stories and the, the people, a, a community is about people, and it's their stories and memories, especially of everyday people that really make up um, what is that intangible cultural heritage. And, and what's very nice is that there's a movement now to, uh, to recognizing the stories of everyday people and how they uh, fill in and add texture to the tapestry of a community. And so I leave you with this quote, which I really love. Stories have to be told or they die. And when they die, we can't remember who we are or why we're here. We're part of a continuum. We're like leaves on a tree that are attached to something else and uh, 
And uh, these memories and these stories help to enrich um, not only our understanding of Chinatown, but per help to build people's linkages back to, to Chinatown, to this really historic uh, community that played such a role in Vancouver's history, but also in, in Canadian history. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, thank you for leaving us with that very powerful message. And I must say, every time I walk by those window, um, storefront windows exhibition, it really added to mine and I'm sure a lot of other people's daily routine too. So thanks for sharing your, about your projects. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speakers now. Um, we are especially appreciative of our next speakers, Suki Chow and Nick Fong, because they are joining from Hong Kong and it is 4.30 a.m. there. So <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Um, Ms. Suki Chow was previously the service in charge of Viva Blue House, the conservation and revitalization of the Blue House cluster scheme for uh, St. James Settlement. She has been engaged in community development projects for about 15 years and is keen on promoting local participation in community issues and community planning. Her experience includes organizing the neighborhood to design and operate community spaces and training local residents as docents to share their stories and the histories and development of the community. Mr. Nick Fong is currently, currently the service in charge of Viva Blue House. Um, he has engaged in policy advocacy and community development for over eight years. Before participating in the Viva Blue House project, he had dedicated himself to housing issues experienced by disadvantaged groups. He is experienced in community organizing and is an advocate for community-led and bottom-up approaches for, for community development. So I'll leave it to you guys uh, to share your presentation. Suki and Nick, thank you so much. Can you, can you all see our slides? Yes. Okay. Very good. So Nick, maybe you can start right the overview of the projects. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, and I'm Nick. And um, Esriki is also here. He and uh, she is the former uh, person in charge of the Blue House project. And I believe Esriki uh, uh, can share more about her valuable experience later. And before introducing our project, uh, let me have a uh, brief introduction of the background of the Wang Chai so that you can have an easier understanding of the context of Blue House. Wan Chai is the, one of the districts in Hong Kong. In the late 19th century, Wan Chai was a mixed used area for Chinese. Uh, this coastal area of Wan Chai was mainly for trading business at that time. So a lot of working class was living in the inner part of Wan Chai. And the next picture showed that the Blue House in 1960. Um, the Blue Hall Cluster is a unique collection of free shop house dating from the 1920. Blue House is a traditional Chinese building. We usually call it Tong Nao. Tong Nao in Hong Kong has been referred to as a tenement house. It reflected the function of such buildings for tenement housing in response to the critical shortage of living quarters to accommodate the raising population in the past. However, uh, Hong uh, Wan Chai has gone through a great reclamation and development in the past years. Economy development first has been the priority for Hong Kong for many years. Under the priority, 
uh, the history and culture are not being respected. Therefore, you can see Wan Chai is surrounding um, by a lot of commercial buildings and the Hong Kong historic buildings were gradually disappeared during the urban medieval process, which started in year 2000. In 2006, uh, the Hong Kong government announced a plan to transform the Brew House Hostel into a tourism spot. This would have spelled the end of the working class community as all the building would be resumed under the urban value for uh, audience and the resident affected which uh, existing uh, residents and shop operator would risk being priced out by the ensuring gentrification. Then we started to organize the participatory planning workshop and invited the Blue Hole Coastal residents, uh, community members and related professional uh, to discuss um, to discuss which way Blue Hole should go. At that time, uh, the participants believed that the Blue House Custer was the only living preservation of the tangible and intangible elements of the tonal culture. It's because there are no retain the historic buildings is representing uh, the working class living history and culture in Hong Kong. Therefore, uh, they started to fight for the government to accept the suggestion of preserving both building and uh, people. And in 2007, the government as accepted the suggestion so the Blue House res residents could say if they want to after the building is renovated. And the Blue House Cluster is the first conservation project in Hong Kong that is entirely initiated and led by social workers uh, for community oriented goals and able to clearly articulate sustainable community development as the long-term objective. The Blue House project not only focuses on the conservation, but also pays close attention to how the project contributes to sustain the community development after the renovation. And the next picture shows uh, the Blue House in 2000, uh, 2015. And the next picture is show that the blue house after the renovation. So you can see we tried to retain the architectural features as much as possible. And this piece uh, and these features always show us many hints of Hong Kong history. And we believe that the conservation is not only about the building, it's also about the people. And the building can show you the past. Uh, while the people can tell you the stories. People are just like a uh, living heritage. They can give you a more comprehensive aspect to understand the community and history. People can also bring us social practice, festival and traditional knowledge, which the building can show us. And this intangible heritage already teaches us how to move the community forward. Therefore, preserving and rebuilding the community bonds is always our priority. And we encourage residents and community stakeholders to share their time, talents and experience to contribute to a sustainable community. And then I will pass to Suki and she will share how we rebuild the community bonds for the process. Thank you, Suki. Thanks so much, Nate. So uh, I guess as uh, Nick have mentioned, uh, Blue House located in Wan Chai, where it used to be a humble, diverse and vibrant communities with strong neighborhoods and community network. But the uh, urban regenerations and gentrifications over the past decades just tear down the communities. And uh, we have no intention to turn the clock back, but we do think that Blue House as an iconic buildings carrying the history and stories of the old Hong Kong that shared by most of the Hong Kong people. Maybe by restoring the buildings, with new structures and new elements injected, we can at the same time restoring the, the communities or reconnecting the community somehow. As next as mentions, there's a few goals and objectives for Blue House revitalization projects like to preserve the local cultures, to provide job opportunities for locals, to showcase 
how participatory patterns can be done. But still, I guess our major goals is to build the communities. So um, we try to do it through three dimensions or approaches. First, as you can see in the slides, is to use new design to facilitate to facilitate the community exchange. The second one is to use soft programs, community engagement programs uh, that I guess I, I, I don't manage to have much time to elaborate more. And the last one will be how we involve the communities in the whole conservation projects. I mean, how we, we articulate some importance or key conservation elements and to to engage the community to 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 come to a decisions and i guess i'm maybe i zoom into the first part of the project is how we use new structures to connect people uh, as you can see in this plant uh, the blue house Blue House is actually a Blue House castle, which involves three buildings, the blue one, the uh, yellow ones, and the orange ones. But it, it actually, it, um, it, it is a castle, but actually it involves three individuals and separate buildings. Uh, with their entrance to different or opposite directions, some of the residents live here for long years or even for generations, they don't know each other. So our design architects purpose, purposefully built uh, or propose a language here so as to connect the buildings which create common space for residents to meet together, um, also to facilitate, to facilitate the exchange. So as you can see in these pictures, this language connecting the blue house, the yellow house and the orange house, and it also creates space for people and the residents because it's connected to the rear door of each unit. So um, it somehow becomes the uh, main entrance of all the uh, units so people can be gathered and uh, have some chat here. So the second features will be um, the open space here. As you can tell in these pictures, there's an enclosed uh, um, uh, open space uh, 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 here, which has been fenced off for decades, I guess. But after the uh, renovations, here, we will pave it as a community space for all people in the communities. And we even invite the community people to pave the floor together. Because we believe that this is going to be their place, so why not we do it together and so that they can enjoy the, the place they build together. So you can see the kids uh, I, I, uh, in the workshops, uh, we involve kids to do their, their pay things together. And we have some community gatherings. This is, uh, I guess this is like two, 2017 or 18, I'm not quite sure. Our um, spring uh, receptions. Here is our uh, mid autumn festival celebrations this year. The last feature is the screen wall. As you can tell in these pictures, there's a screen wall there, which is the external wall of the orange house. So uh, maybe show you more clear in these elevations. So we'll have the monthly movie screening here. Uh, it also allows some of the young artists or some directors to share their, their movies or documentations, documentaries uh, with the communities in this open space. Here we share the Disney cartoon for family. Uh, I guess I still have tons of story to share on Blue House, but I'll be 
uh, ran out of time. So I guess Nick and I would like to end our presentations with a short video, which hope to give you brief ideas on the whole projects of Blue House. So hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry, I guess I... Suki, we stopped hearing the audio. Do you mind unmuting yourself to see if that helps?
so I guess I end the video here. So thanks so much again for having us and um, looking forward for more exchange in the Q&A sections. Thank you. Thank you, Suki and Nick. And that was a really great presentation. And sorry about the little technical issue there, but we hope we can share your video with the audience uh, after today. And um, so I will introduce our next speaker. Last but not least, we have Katie Kummer. Dr. Katie Kummer is a heritage consultant based in uh, Victoria, BC. She has researched, taught, and written on the adaptive reuse of heritage assets, explored the applicability of the historic urban landscape approach, as well as designed and coordinated numerous cultural mapping studies, including the most recently, including most recently in the city of Vancouver's Chinatown. Though Canadian by birth, she is also a Hong Konger, having spent most of her life in Asia's world city. She also taught at the University of Hong Kong, uh, specifically the architectural conservation programs for nearly a decade before moving back to BC a few years ago, and she now works as a heritage consultant. Uh, so welcome, Katie, and I'll pass it over to you for your presentation. Sorry, I think you're muted, Katie. <laughs> there we go. There it, go. Kept it, it kept telling me I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed. So um, anyway, thank you so much. And I have to say, this was very cruel to make me go after Suki and Nick, because I feel like I'm going to cry watching the Hong Kong video. So anyway, hello. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm so honored to be here. Uh, forgive me. I feel very flustered now because of that. Uh, let me share, if I may. Can everyone see okay? Yes, we see your PowerPoint, yep. Okay, fantastic. Um, anyway, thank you so much. I am I am honored to be here uh, speaking to you from the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking people, uh, specifically the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. Um, and it just really is an honor to be here and, and to be with you all and talking about these important subjects. Um, I know time is short, so I'm not gonna spend too long on this, but I, I wanted to explain a little bit of who I am and why I care about Chinatown. And in many ways, I am the reverse Chinatown story. I was born in Canada, but I moved to Hong Kong. And that is where I spent most of my life prior to moving to BC a few years ago. Um, and uh, I have a multi-generational connection to Hong Kong with my grandparents having time there, as well as my parents, as well as myself and having my children there. And I was amazed, you know, Catherine's presentation about photographs. Um, I, I found this photograph from the 1960s that my grandfather took of an area that 50 years later I would take students to uh, to do cultural mapping workshops of, you know, so these layers of history for me. Hong Kong is that place. Um, and then also this photograph from the 1970s that my father took uh, of the old Hong Kong post office that was demolished in the late 1970s without much concern. The public didn't care so much. Um, so again, this was a building that I would then go on 40 years later to teach students about and how people didn't protest its demolition. So um, for me, I, I find uh, obviously that connection there uh, is really what makes me care about Chinatown because so my family having these multiple decades worth of, of connection to Hong Kong, Vancouver's Chinatown is the place that feels the most like home. It smells, sounds like home. It smells like home. It tastes like home um, and is, is a nice home away from home for me. So, um, but yes, I, I also had my babies in, in Hong Kong as well. So I have my own pre-married babies as well. So, so that's me in a nutshell in terms of who I am and why I care about Chinatown. Um, and I also just wanted to talk briefly about my sort of early career um, with the architecture conservation programs and sort of how this led me to being connected with Chinatown um, once I moved here. So I worked with Dr. Dr. Lee Ho Yin, pictured here on the left in black and white, and Linda Stefano for, for a number of years with the architectural conservation programs. And there were two aspects in particular that uh, I think was a really important focus and, and training ground leading into my work in, in Vancouver's Chinatown. And one was we did a series of cultural mapping workshops over multiple years, both within Hong Kong, but also within Asia. And we also did a series of World Heritage Site field studies with students. So going year on year to see the impact of World Heritage designation, um, in particular in urban environments. So looking at Penang's Georgetown, it was so wonderful to hear Lindley speak today. Um, and again, 
seeing sort of the, the impact of that designation over time, same from Macau, going year on year and kind of seeing the changes, the ups, the downs, um, and the, the long-term impact of what that designation can mean. Because I think right now there's a lot of reflection happening in terms of um, what that designation can and cannot mean, um, what can happen, what, what you know, sometimes does, sometimes doesn't. Um, in particular, this idea of, of cities transitioning from a living city to being an idealized reproduction of itself, or living landscapes becoming static museums. Um, and I think being able to kind of see these places firsthand and how they have managed those issues has been really interesting. And I think, of course, for Chinatown uh, is of, of interesting relevance as they potentially consider this designation process too. So um, before I get into the work that I've done with Chinatown, I did also kind of want to just bridge the two presentations between our Vancouver presentations and the Hong Kong one and provide maybe a little bit of um, just some, some reflection and, and possible inspiration for Vancouver's Chinatown based on the Hong Kong experience. Because I see a lot of what Vancouver's going through right now, we saw in Hong Kong in the post-1997 period, sort of those growing pains, the search for identity and recognition and understanding. Um, and one thing that I think is really interesting that Hong Kong did do um, was ratify along with China and the, both Hong, China and the Hong Kong SAR government, um, the UNESCO Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. And amazingly, to me. Uh, Canada has still not. And I think this is kind of a big issue and, and obviously perhaps something for a bigger conversation on another day. But I think it was really amazing to me that they did latch on to this and we've seen the progress from that. So it resulted in an intangible cultural heritage, uh, heritage unit, ICH unit being established. Um, and they embarked on a territory wide survey. So they asked for public input over multiple years to try and determine, okay, what is the ICH of Hong Kong? Um, and they were able to distill it all down into an inventory of 480 items based on UNESCO's domains. And I'll talk a little bit more about those when I talk about the inventory I did for Chinatown. But these are oral traditions and expressions, performing arts, social practices, rituals, and festive events, knowledge and practices concerning nature and the universe, as well as traditional craftsmanship. So these are sort of the hooks of UNESCO's ICH domains that is to sort of guide uh, your ICH determination for your region. Um, there was also, so in addition to that piece, um, there was the Star Ferry Pier incident in 2006, and I find this a really important point to talk about. I mentioned the Hong Kong Post Office. It was demolished without much fanfare. Um, and there were so many buildings in Hong Kong that were demol demolished through the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s in the case of progress. Um, but for whatever reason, this working class pier, this pier for the every person, for the everyday worker, is what finally made them go, enough, stop demolishing our heritage, let us fight to protect it. And unfortunately, the battle was lost, but I think a lot of progress has been made from it. It makes me think a little bit of the 105 Kiefer Street incident for Chinatown, and just sort of the, the galvanizing of the community and bringing people together um, was really valuable and really important. So it really was this, this conservation catalyst um, and so much progress has been made as a result of it. And I think it makes the bitter pill of losing that um, a little bit easier to swallow. So the Development Bureau was formed shortly thereafter to handle both conservation and development concerns. And through that, they did the Revitalizing Historic Buildings through partnership scheme. And actually the Blue House project that Suki and Nick so kindly just told us about was part of one of those batches of buildings. And this is was taking government owned buildings and requesting applications for nonprofit use to see how you could revitalize the building. Um, and with a real focus on the community impact and it actually having a positive contribution to the various neighborhoods that these buildings were located in. Um, and I, I could say a lot more about it, but I will leave it at that. But I think that was a really important piece of, of Hong Kong's experience that we continue to see the benefits of. Um, so to bring it back to Chinatown for a moment, forgive me if I'm going too fast. Um, so I left Hong Kong and very happily fell in with, with Henry Yu, and he was very excited about recruiting uh, Dr. Lee Ho Yin to come and talk uh, to the City of Vancouver staff, as well as to the societies, as well as to the community at large. And I was, I was roped in to assist with that as well, just sort of talking about the World Heritage Site experience, 
um, in Asia as possible inspiration for Vancouver, and also just talking about the conservation of Vancouver's Chinatown and really emphasizing this idea of a living community. Um, because I think that's something that's really worried about, obviously, is, is the loss of a living and vibrant community. Um, you know, the preservation of space that, that doesn't have a soul is, is pointless in many ways. So, um, so we talked about that. There was also the, um, the Asian reconnaissance that we had done to sort of, again, provide inspiration. And then through 2019, I um, helped doing this cultural mapping exercise. And it really was seen as kind of a phase one of what would hopefully have been multiple phases. Um, but of course, the world fell apart. Uh, we finished in the fall of 2019, and so much has changed since then. And in many ways, I'm very grateful for what we did in terms of cataloging everything before so much change continued to take place. So this really was about looking at the area and, and inventorying, much like Lindley had talked about, um, and cataloging what is within that space today. Um, and it was looking at both the physical aspect, the tangible, as well as the intangible, and putting it together into map form. Um, again, just being able to, to, to read and understand the place um, and the important uses of these places through, through time and space. So the inventory really compiled sort of base data, as well as the tangible related data, what you feel like you would more typically see, as well as the intangible elements as well. And so just as an example, this is the, the Wong Association building that Ainsley very kindly spoke to about um, momentarily ago. This is just sort of the breakdown of a section of it in terms of the identified CDEs, character defining elements, so those real tangible elements, as well as the intangible with the historical associations, historically significant uses, cultural connections, those intangible, uh, the ICH domains from UNESCO, so breaking it down as well, in addition to, um, I hope that's not blocking you guys, uh, in addition to the Chinatown legacy uh, values. So the CTT Chinatown transformation team also um, put together sort of, the, as, as I say, their legacy values, and we tried to, to anchor these in space as well. Um, and this was all done through a series of, of public engagement exercises, again, getting that input from the community to understand, you know, the places of significance to them. Um, and then this resulted, and I won't read all of this, but in, a, in sort of a, a, a phase one report that had, uh, of course, eight recommendations for luck, um, kind of addressing where do, where do you go from here? And so there was a few that were related to sort of the cultural mapping exercise and, and expanding it. So engaging the community further and expanding that initial inventory, as well as working on further, further visualization of the data and exploring potentially expanding the study outside the more restrictive HA1 and HA1A boundary. We felt like that boundary was very arbitrary. You know, what, what about Strathcona? What about these areas? What about Hogan's Alley? Things like that. So kind of encouraging, taking the ball further with regards to the, the initial legwork that we had done. Um, and then of course, updating the Chinatown SOS. I know Lindley talked about the importance of that statement of significance and I think because of how the field has changed, there is much more of an emphasis on a need for cons to consider the intangible elements as well as the tangible. So really updating that to be more rep representative. And then of course, also looking into the historic urban landscape approach. I know this what is, this session is called. Um, and so I wanted, I couldn't help the academic in me. I will address that momentarily as to what exactly we mean by that. So I was encouraging sort of further exploration of that and its potential adoption and, and, and adaptation to Vancouver. Then, of course, working on the management plan, which they've been working on since uh, the last two years, and then further community engagement about the World Heritage Site designation, seeing if there was an appetite for it, seeing if, if it seemed like a viable choice for Vancouver, and working on that articulation of the statement of outstanding universal value. Um, I know Lindley spoke about the Georgetown um, OUV this morning. Um, so drafting that for Vancouver's Chinatown as well, in addition to doing the comparative analysis research that would be part of the next step of the UNESCO designation process if they so choose to go on that. So very briefly, again, the academic in me, um, just so we understand what exactly we mean by the historic urban landscape, it really is um, sort of moving the heritage conservation field forward in recognizing that it, it needs to be more than just the physical built environment, but instead focusing on both tangible and intangible qualities. Um, so really taking into account existing built environments, intangible heritage, cultural diversity, socioeconomic and environmental factors, along with community values. So it's really about looking more broadly, more holistically at areas, um, and really with the goal of, of enhancing livability and encouraging economic development and social cohesion. 
Um, so just in conclusion as to you know where we go from here for Chinatown, I think from my perspective, I really think that there is a need for, for greater foregrounding of ICH, both within Chinatown, but also Vancouver, BC, and Canada-wide. I feel like, again, I find it mind-boggling that Canada has not signed on to this, and I think it's resulting in some friction and challenges in terms of the communities who are here and are willing to recognize and promote their ICH when there isn't a framework or an understanding of that at a, at a higher level. level. Um, so that's the one. Two, I would say in terms of the historic urban landscape approach, again, further exploration in terms of its um, adaptation and, and adoption for the area. Um, again, as I said before, looking into the designation process and recognizing that even if you don't go for the, the final designation, that the process is valuable in and of itself, getting the community together, getting everyone thinking about um, why the place matters and why it's worth saving, I think is, is worthwhile in and of itself. And then lastly would be funding and action. I think one thing I found a little disheartening, although also encouraging, is that there is a level of, of interest in this area that goes so far back um, and so reading through all of the reports in the last 20, 30 years, I feel that there has been so much that has been researched and written on this place. I, I hope for Chinatown, we're able to, to, to actually put it into action and put it into process. And so for me, that is the, the, the big one, is, is, is the funding and actually getting to move it forward. There's the political will currently, there is the, the community will, uh, but I just, I, it really seems to come down to the funding aspect. So I wish we could transplant the Hong Kong Jockey Club equivalent to Vancouver to provide that funding. This is one of the most successful projects in Hong Kong to date. It's the revitalization of the former Central Police Station compound. And it's been amazing to see what they've been able to do with, with in essence, unlimited funding. So I know that's not necessarily viable for Vancouver, but I think there really is a need to, to you know, to get the money in hand to be able to move forward because there's nothing worse than derelict buildings because the longer they are left, the, the harder it is uh, to bring them back. So anyway, thank you so much. Thank you, Katie, um, for really tying everything together and kind of showing examples in Hong Kong and Vancouver and, and what it means for our Chinatown. And so uh, now we're bringing everyone back uh, on screen to have a joint discussion. Uh, we have several questions, um, but um, I also want to encourage um, that this is not like, I'm not controlling the conversation that much. Uh, so uh, when we have time for questions that maybe panelists have for each other as well, uh, let's have a conversation together about those. Okay, so, um, since we haven't heard uh, from Aisley in a while, maybe I'll address the first question uh, to her. So Ainsley, you talked about really the Wong Society buildings experience and you talked about a lot of the challenges. Um, uh, could you also expand on that a little bit in terms of how clans associations in Vancouver can uh, exist in, uh, in the, into the future? We're giving this a lot of thought right now. Um, one of the things that we are going to need to do is to uh, reevaluate our purpose and our use of the space as we go forward. And um, that's going to require um, a lot of discussion between the, I guess, the factions of the older generation and the newer generation within the clan to reach some kind of agreement. And on, on both sides, that's going to require a lot of um, a lot of patience and understanding. Of course, our um, our heritage is in in oral tradition. Uh, we we you know we don't we don't really have a um, you know an official written history book that we could refer to. So when we're looking at uh, what's gone on in the past and the rationale for why the clan believes what it does and why it, why it exists and why it wants to continue existing, we really need to have the patience to uh, to sit at the table with some of our our elders and to to sort of have that respect for a, for a two-way dialogue and it's going to require some respect and understanding on both sides. I think that's sort of the the, the short answer as we, we look to uh, to how we can continue to exist. Thank you, Ainsley. And when you talked about the, the elders as a very important stakeholder group for 
um, the Wands Association. It also brings me to think about um, uh, the Blue House in Hong Kong, Suki and Nick. You talked about engaging your stakeholders. Could you kind of paint a picture with us about who they are and how do you connect with such a diverse group? Yep. Uh, yep. Maybe I try to answer the questions and see if Nick has any supplementary information to share. Um, yes, actually, we, we are facing a very diverse community where, because, because Wan Chai is located in the heart of cities, so uh, it's under gentrifications. So we have a diverse and mix of people old and new, which and poor, with multicultural backgrounds. So I guess if Catherine is trying to use photos, the amazing historical photos, to, to, to tell stories and to connect people, Blue House is somehow using objects to tell stories. And maybe to engage people, we, we hope to engage people. Uh, we are still engaging people using objects. And Nick and the team are still using you using objects, um, because as you can imagine, this blue house was built for the working class and the grassroots people. And by that time, I guess grassroots contribute to the majorities of the Hong Kong people. So the story unwritten in the blue house and ranch high somehow what's unworthy stories of our parents and grand grandparents' generations. So uh, we continue to collect objects uh, with history and story from the neighborhoods. Of course, storage uh, is one of our, our major headaches, but, um, but I believe the, the, the headache to, to Nick. So he's handling it well, I guess. <laughs> and um, especially due to uh, urban regenerations, uh, quite a lot of French residents have to move, move, move their home, move out from French communities. So something they cannot move to to their new home, so they no donate it to us. So I guess we managed to collect like over thousands of old furnitures, photos, belonging, artifacts. So um, which uh, each of these objects have a, a stories and an amazing story that, that told how grassroots people and how working class and how the community people used to live in this community and how they used to interact here. So uh, lucky enough, uh, each summer we can manage to invite a group of internship students, which is mostly young people from the college. They help us to sort out these objects and to archive the stories. Uh, maybe I can share you some pictures. Uh, can I share my screen here? Yes, this is one of the campaigns. We uh, like a two two day campaign to my memories. So we uh, we 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 displayed like three hundred items we collect from Blue House that left behind uh, before the. Uh, Foundations, and we, we invite these uh, community people, the 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 um, long living residents here, to share their stories. And now uh, we have we organize some exhibitions, and in one of our exhibitions, uh, uh, tiny exhibitions areas. So uh, we have seasonal exhibitions, so that makes sure each of the items we collect can be shared and with the publics. And we have an other, uh, we call it a heritage in interpretations areas uh, in, uh, in the third forest. So what he, this is th that we leave some memos here that allow people to contribute their stories uh, 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 by that age so that we, we continue to to, to share and collect and evolve so that this is not only an archive, but a process. And uh, also we train up some local residents to be the docents so that they can, they can pass on the stories to, to, to the next generations and, and to, to the kids. Yeah, I guess that, that's uh, one of the examples on how we are using story, I could say, or objects to, to engage 
such a diverse communities or maybe Nick if you have any anything to add please feel free to do it well I think oh. uh, Shuki is giving and you ask a comprehensive um yeah. presentation so I mean that at that moment and this moment I don't have anything to add <laughs> okay well we'll come back to you Nick <laughs> So the idea of stories is, has also really, I like, guess, made the connection to Catherine's presentation mm -hmm. about photos and storytelling. And I'd want to expand on this conversation a little bit more. And maybe this question would be more for Catherine or um, in a Chinatown context. Would you be able to share with us um, like a little bit about why or you, why you think personal stories are so important? Um, for everyday people, but also to uh, and how it's relevant to uh, intangible cultural heritage for Chinatown. Oh, you are. Uh, yeah. Okay, sorry, got stuck <laughs> trying to get on mute. Um, one thing I, I I would say just in in my practice with people because I'm often interviewing people who are in their 80s and 90s. Um, I actually never use the word story with them. I don't say, you know, tell me a story because they often freeze up. I, I don't have a story. So I talk about memories. What is your memories of this? What is your memory of that? And almost always people will have a memory and things like photographs really, what's interesting is that a photograph uh, will not only help them share a memory of that photo, but it often, you know, cascades into a whole bunch of other memories that are attached to that. So uh, photographs and artifacts like you're using in Blue House are, are magical. They're really magical for getting underneath, uh, underneath these stories and collecting them. And I, I, I mean, I firmly believe that a community as I mentioned in my presentation, is about people. Everywhere in the world, there's concrete. Everywhere in the world, there's telephone poles and windows. But what's, it's the people that are in it, the people that have been moved through and climbed those stairs and ran these different businesses. That is what the essence of that community is. And, you know, we tend to, um, in the past have tended to focus in on the most famous people in Chinatown, those that were the trailblazers, they were the first to become the politician or the first to do this. But really, the bulk of the community were just everyday people, your know, shopkeepers, uh, ran a restaurant, had a laundry. Um, and, and it's, it's actually a golden age in some ways for these stories, because it, it's now starting to be in the last, I would say, five to 10 years that the stories of everyday people are becoming interesting, that they're, they're something that we're starting to preserve and value. These are part of that intangible heritage. This is all the things that we're attached to. They're all part of this tapestry that makes up what, what was and what is and what will be uh, Chinatown. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, exactly. I also love um, kind of your note about asking folks to share memories and, and kind of engaging in that way. That's very, you know, important to understand contextually where we are when we engage uh, about specific issues. So I really appreciated that comment. Um, shifting our focus a little bit, but also on the topic of intangible cultural heritage. And Katie has mentioned that, you know, like what, like what Catherine said, how we're shifting our focus to really um, more so uh, be able to appreciate this form of heritage. And that's kind of a, a trend that we see in uh, both academic uh, as also in the heritage world. So Katie, I would like to ask you to, if you could expand on that a little bit, but if you would also like to draw some examples from, from Asian cities and Hong Kong and how would, how would Vancouver fit in? What should we do? That's a big question. What should we do? <laughs> um, I think, you know, it's funny from a lot of the presentations, one thing that really jumped out for me, and I think that we are hamstringed by here, both in 
in Vancouver and in BC and in Canada more broadly is it, I feel that our bureaucratic and administrative system is too rigid and it, and it doesn't have the nuance or the flexibility um, to acknowledge that you know not everywhere is the same and not everywhere should have to have the same rules apply to them when it is so dynamic. And I think it's something, there's no easy answer, unfortunately, but I, I've been very inspired, um, for example, in, in Shanghai, you know, you wouldn't necessarily expect it, but there is a level of, of flexibility to their requirements with things such as the fire system. This is something that has come up in a couple different presentations. How do you address the upgrading of these historic buildings to modern requirements? Um, and I was amazed, you know, we've, we've toured students at all sorts of different adaptive reuse projects at um, their willingness to compromise. Okay, fine, the code says you have to have the fire extinguisher on the ceiling. The ceiling is a character defining element. How do we find the flexibility that you still have the protection, but you're not damaging something? And okay, fine, you can put it on the wall but I don't necessarily see that flexibility in the system here in the same way. There are the rules, there are the bylaws, this is what we're gonna follow. Yep, nope, sorry, doesn't matter when it was built, who it was for, that there's all these other elements that matter. And I find that a little bit heartbreaking because I feel like decisions are made being guided by things that don't account for the complexity of the, the spaces that they're being affected by. So that, that was one thing that I wish, you know, I, I feel this is just a sort of a wish list of what I want to see here, but I, I would love to see greater flexibility and under, understanding that not every place should be treated the same when it's when it's so old and so complicated. Um, and I think you see another element with that with the seismic upgrading requirements. I, I'm just gonna share actually a slide that I, I find fascinating. Um, da, 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 where am I? Uh, that I think helps to kind of explain some of the challenges that we face. Can everyone see that? No. Yes, no, yes? Yeah. Okay, so I find this really interesting um, because so much of our, the funding for conservation work um, is very piecemeal. <laughs> there isn't a whole lot of funding that comes from the federal level. It typically is much more based on the provinces. Um, and I thought it was interesting that in a number of these presentations, we've talked about the, the immense cost for seismic upgrading, but clearly this is a, a bigger issue, largely just for us in our region. If you look at the breakdown of this, right? So, you know, we're, we're over here in the literally the most dangerous area. And of course, we are actually one of the areas that has uh, the least amount of funding um, in, in regards to that. So I, I think, I feel like there needs to be a bit of an overhaul system as to how, how this type of work is funded um, and an acknowledgement that not every area in Canada is the same. Um, and the last thing I was gonna say, just in terms of lessons from overseas, there's a real focus here to our detriment on the, the you know, everything has to be money-making to justify the expense. And this is something I have been inspired by Hong Kong. Um, and of course it's hard because Hong Kong has so much money. <laughs> like I get it. And it's one city. <laughs> I like Suki. No, no, you do. Suki, you have no idea how much money you guys have over there. Um, that I, I do think it impacts what people are willing to do. And unfortunately, heritage conservation work, the, the conservation of both the built environment and the intangible, you cannot be thinking about, you know, return on investment because you can't quantify the value of saving tradition, of saving, you know, these places that matter. That needs to be taken out of the equation. It doesn't matter what the return on investment is. It needs to just be done. And the longer it's delayed and kicked down the road, more expensive it's going to be and the higher likelihood everything will be lost. So anyway, not to be too dire, but <laughs> my, no. my few cents. <laughs> That's a very powerful and important message. All right, Katie, I want to take actually if does Ainsley want to expand on that a little bit about your building and kind of the upgrades that you've had, had to deal with? What do you think? I guess the question would be, um, what does the city need to do to support heritage buildings and, and the things that happen inside them? Um, with respect to the building, I mean, like Katie said, we, uh, we'd like to see some flexibility and some ease of going through the process. Um, listening to this morning's talks and listening to uh, professionals like Barry McGinn and John Atkins saying that they are, um, they, they get confused by the complicated layers of requirements. Um, you know, we're, we're not we're not trained professionals, we're volunteers, we're trying to improve 
um, upon our space in, in small in small ways. And sometimes the, the regulation makes it really, really costly and really difficult. So if, if there was just a, a way to, to make it easier, if there was a more, um, if there was a way to help us through the process in, in a more prescriptive way that was also flexible, I mean, I think that's sort of what we what we would ask for. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ainsley. I also saw uh, Suki nodding your head, and I was wondering if you'd like to share kind of in your experience working on the Blue House project, um, what do you think are the lessons learned for um, for Chinatown? Uh, I guess uh, I, I guess I have to, to echo on Katie's uh, response to your previous questions that on money is, uh, I guess the, the uh, one of the major challenge that I'm, I'm not sure you've made, I guess this challenge is uh, one of the headaches of make now, but I, I just I, I just give my my thoughts and maybe Nick can share more. I guess how to, uh, of course we have to invest, invest a lot on uh, revitalize the buildings, but how, but uh, in Hong Kong, in Blue House case, we have to make it self finance. Uh, I mean, I mean, what we have to do is we have to earn each penny's default on maintaining the buildings. Uh, so we have to make a quite fine balance on how to make it self finance and how to make it affordable. Uh, to the community and to 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 diverse peoples, so this is one of the issues that I would like to echo. And when you come to say lesson learned, I guess the major lesson learned for 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 Blue House, but I'm not sure if it is relevant to to uh, Chinatown is to I guess is to prioritize the objective or the objective that we wish to to do because in the Blue House projects, we have so much stakeholders, so much key stakeholders, so much advisors, and each of them have their, their own expectations on the Blue House projects. I, I, I guess we all have all these expectations, like we would like Blue House to be, to be, uh, to, to promote the local cultures, we would like Blue House to self finance. We would like Blue House to be a social innovation project. We would like Blue House to, to provide um, employment for local communities. We have so much objective, but we have, we, we, if uh, we can turn the clock back, I guess uh, at the very first place, we will engage all the key community stakeholders, at least to, to come up with a, a priorities on which is the most importance because when uh, in, I guess I guess in the past ten years in Blue House we actually have so much disagreement and we have so much time spent on discussing over the um, technical issues because we don't have this priority in the very first place. Uh, I guess take 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 the four time as as in examples like because blue house itself is a um a historical buildings revitalization project but somehow this is the foundations of uh, the um staying tenants home so um when you say the how to upgrade the uh historical buildings to nowadays standards so um, we come across a an issue that because uh, we have some four tile. Uh, let me see if I can show some pictures. Sorry, Suki. We since we're running a little oh, bit I'm sorry. short on time. Okay. <laughs> I so just want to make here. sure. Yeah, if that's okay. But that was very uh, interesting. Yeah, Katie. Can I just ask Suki a very quick question? <laughs> sure. I promise very fast because I just I'm I'm interested for the inside scoop about the revitalization scheme and mm. funding because I feel like this connects to the funding conversation. Um, mm. So the the revitalization scheme they they talk about where justified they're willing to fund certain things. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So it says here one off grant. Yeah, I want to move this. 
a one-off grant to cover the cost of major renovation, or yep. they could do a nominal rental for the buildings, or a one-off grant for the starting cost and operating yep. deficit. This is down here. Yep. And I was just curious, uh, as a batch two, obviously social work emphasis, were you eligible for any of those? Was it justified or not in your case? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We justify to all the all the items that you have mentioned. Oh, it's actually, I guess this is for all the uh, all batch of the projects. Uh, we received the, the grants for the renovations, and they man uh, they they kind of love to cover the the loss uh, in the first three year of the operations. But start from year four, we have to be self finance forever. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you for expanding that. No worries, we have a few quick minutes. Um, before our last kind of rapid fire question, I also want to give Catherine a bit of a more opportunity to talk about her work. Um, I guess that what the key question here is, we're talking about community empowerment and community advocacy um, as part of both Suki, Ainsley, and also of course, uh, Katie's uh, examples. Um, what would you like to see more of in Chinatown in terms of this in type of engagement um, and how would we use that to preserve uh, Chinatown's cultural heritage? Well, I just, I do want to recognize that there is a lot that is going on in the last uh, number of years. The work that UBC has been doing there, there's the new Chinese Canadian Museum, there's uh, the Chinatown Storytelling Center, which is going to open soon. There's the work of the transformation team. There's the, just in the last a month, a month or so, we had two major events that are drawing people back. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, you know, we're all trying to make sure that, that in another 20 years, it won't be just Chinatown in name only. We want it to be living, breathing, have this strong tie to the past, but also balanced with the present, that its uniqueness is preserved, that uh, we support creativity, and that we make it relevant again to new generations that are growing up, uh, not just Chinese, but also, um, but also other communities. And we're, we're doing some of that work. I just think we need to do more of it. And we need to, I'm going back to Ian's like, have you ever been in the Wong Association? It is the most amazing building to walk through and the history in there. And the, you know, again, if the walls could talk and being able to, to protect those buildings and to eventually open them up so that people can't care about what they don't know. And so by knowing that, by actually seeing and experiencing some of those buildings, um, I think that's one of the greatest gifts that we collectively could give to the next generation into Chinatown. Awesome, thank you. And I think very, you might have well already said. answered that rapid question, but you can expand on it if you want later on too. This, this last question that we're going to end today's session with that everyone, uh, all the panelists will uh, have a chance to answer is, what is the single most important thing you hope to see for Chinatown? And short and sweet. Um, let's start with Ainsley. An authentic Chinatown, the living, working, breathing Chinatown neighborhood that we have, we want to maintain that. We don't want uh, a sanitized tourist district. We want the, the area where people live and work and continue to cook and go about their daily lives. We are a museum and we're a living museum and that's what we want to preserve. Awesome. Uh, Suki and Nick, or, or one after the other. Maybe do you first. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I hope uh, the, the Chinatown to be, I mean, the renovated Chinatown will not only be for Chinese community, it will be for all the Canadians. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Nick. Thank you, Suki. And <laughs> um, I think the um, uh, Without any uh, concern, the continuous effort to keep the heritage alive, um, we could lose the community as we know it. So I hope to see that different parties and stakeholders and the committee members have, can give their support to retain the cultural heritage of the Chinatown in order to continue demonstrating how unique the Chinatown is to the world. Thank you. And Catherine. Oh, I everything that everyone said. <laughs> I took <laughs> enough time, thank you. <laughs> okay, last but not least, Katie. 
Yeah, I feel Catherine, what you what you said in your last comment was just so perfect and so spot on. Um, but yeah, I think for me, it's it's again echoing what you've all said, and and I think you know a, a well funded. <laughs> I, I hate to come down just to the to the, to the the practicality of it, but I feel like all of these ideas are so well-meaning, but if they're not properly financed in the long term, I really think it's not going to be for anything. Um, so I hope it, it can be that we can capitalize on this momentum and this care and consideration that is this moment, um, but actually have it be sustainable in, in the long term and for the future. So thank you so much. Thank you, Katie, and thank you everyone for joining the panel today. I think we would also continue receiving questions in, in, this, in the Slido. I think we didn't get to all the audience questions, um, but obviously there has been a very dynamic and deep discussion and there's a lot of things that we learned today. And we'll continue the discussion on the other panels uh, for the rest of today and tomorrow.